All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome back to church. If you're in the lobby, make your way in. We'll get started this evening. Hopefully we don't get rained on tonight a little bit. I don't know, but none of you will melt, I don't think, right? Some of you are sweet enough to melt. Maybe you, but not Matt, okay? <laughs> Matt, I'm glad to see you. Lizzie Beth, I'm glad to see you back. Welcome home. Good to have you back in the, uh, in the Baltimore area. Appreciate that. Well, let's begin with prayer, and then Pastor Mike will come and lead us in some songs. We've got a good night planned tonight. Pastor Tyler's preaching, and uh, we're looking forward to that. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for allowing us to be back in your house tonight. God, thank you for allowing us to get here safely. I do pray you'd protect us all tonight uh, if there's any bad weather. God, I also pray for the message. I pray for the service tonight. Uh, I pray you'd help uh, Pastor Tyler, give him any clarity of thought. Give him uh, wisdom from your word tonight to be able to preach. And God, I pray you'd be with those who are in our nursery tonight. Thank you for them. Give them a special blessing for serving uh, during our service here. Uh, God, we never want to take people that serve in our church for granted. Uh, we understand that they do it for you, uh, but it does bless the rest of us. And God, we thank you for that. God, thank you for those who are uh, playing instruments tonight. Thank you for those who are singing specials. Uh, those who are uh, manning doors and taking offerings and cleaning and all kinds of things, setting up for our snacks tonight. All those things are important. God, thank you that we have a church that likes to pitch in and help and serve in any way possible. God, I pray you just bless us in a special way this evening. We love you and thank you for loving us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Pastor Mike. Good to see you tonight. Hopefully you have had a great day today. Did you get some rest today? A little bit of a nap? No shut-eye? Everybody was wide awake? Oh my goodness, I'm sorry to hear that. Well, um, there were some of you in my Sunday school class that got a little nap today, um, but that's okay. That's okay. Good to see you tonight. Appreciate you being here and looking forward to enjoying the evening with you tonight. I have a lot in store for you. And uh, we'll fill you in as the night unfolds. Let's stand to our feet and sing a couple songs together. Uh, one of the songs that we introduced this morning, uh, Lord, I Lift Your Name on High, uh, he talks about going from the earth to the sky. Now, we talked about this morning about also in the glorified body, if you remember that. We talked about that with complete and the... And all that is future for us. So I thought tonight would be good when preparing all the worship songs for today that we would sing a little bit about heaven tonight. Uh, there's a song that I just reached, recently purchased that I have, like to put together a small group of people to sing it. And it'll tie a lot into about heaven and things. But uh, sometimes it's good to think about heaven. Um, it really gives you a hope to live presently, doesn't it? Um, sometimes we get so discouraged, we get so downhearted, we get so distraught with what's going on in our society and I understand it can be discouraging, too. There was a lot of great prophets that served the Lord in the Old Testament who would just get discouraged over the things that they saw. And um, God had to admonish them, too, sometimes. And a lot of times he would do it through prophecy. He would prophesy and give them a word of a vision to what was coming for Israel down the road. And um, so I think that's a good point of practice for us as well. Uh, there's certain things that God has used men of Scripture to write about and pr prophecy for us to look forward to, especially uh, a lot of the book of Revelation, uh, some of the book of Matthew. Uh, we can look forward to understand that God's program is still fully intact with everything that he wants to do. And no matter how much of a of a stronghold Satan has in this world, we can have hope of heaven one day. Let's sing a couple songs this evening about that. An old faithful at our church, <laughs> when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Let's sing it together. We'll sing all three verses, number 566 if you need it. Join me on the first. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more. Oh, 
I don't know. I don't know how all that's gonna happen. Greg Canterbury. You're supposed to say here, Greg. I'm, we're pretending this is heaven. You didn't say anything. Greg Canterbury. Here. There you go. Here. I don't know what that's gonna look like, but we know there's a role. We know there's a Lamb's Book of Life. So we do know that part of the song is real. I don't know how it's all going to work, any things like that. But if there is a role, don't do what Greg did. And they're calling you. You better make sure. Here! Greg Miller! Here! There you go. Confidently here. All right? Very good. Let's sing another song tonight. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Let's sing all three verses tonight. Wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. Keep singing. Darkness away, Jesus my Savior I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend. He met the need of my heart. Shattered the spell. on the second. Ready? Born of a spirit with life from above into God's family divine. Justified fully through Calvary's love. Oh, what a standing is And the transaction so quickly was made when as a sinner I came took the offer of grace he did proffer in sin. Oh, praise him. another one tonight you don't have this one in your hymn book so you're gonna have to just follow along on the screen behind me but it's in another song book I've been using I'll fly away you should know it well if your hands get clapping if your feet get stomping that's okay you will not lose your salvation over that I promise all right let's sing if we can on the first ready some glad morning when this life is over I'll fly away Shadows 
there's no doubt in my mind that when we stand before the presence of the Lord, we will clearly be able to, st to say we're standing on holy ground. As a matter of fact, anybody who has ever interfaced with what they know to be the person of Jesus in the Old Testament or a theophany of some sort, often were instructed to take off their shoes for the place where they're standing is holy ground. And I don't know how all that again will unfold. We don't get a whole lot of understanding of that. Although I do know this, that if you read Revelation chapter 5 and the beasts, the four beasts that are flying around the throne, um, I liken them to be seraphim similar to what we see in Isaiah chapter number 6. That what they utter out of their mouths amongst the praises that they're offering to the one sitting on the throne is this, simply holy, holy, holy. I want to sing a song with you. We are standing on holy ground. It's just a short chorus. There's no verses to it, but I want to sing through it twice tonight. We are standing on holy ground. Again, this is a chorus that's not in your hymn books, but just follow along behind me on the screen. I think we'll pick it up good. Ready? We are standing. sing it a cappella on that chorus one more time. Let's sing together, can we? We are standing on holy ground and I know that there are angels all around Let share it with you. I'm grateful to be able to ultimately share it with Jesus, but it's going to be extra special to have you there as well. Looking forward to that. I'm going to turn things over to Pastor at this time. He's got a little bit of a special music audible that he's called on me tonight, so I'm not going to assume how this is going to unpack, so I'm just going to let him take it from here. <coughs> you can be seated. Sorry. There's a real special guy that really the Lord brought into my life um, well over a year ago now, Jackie Freeman and Vicki. Uh, they kind of got this thing rolling, and we appreciate them. And um, Jackie Freeman uh, is a widower, and um, I'll let him tell you a little bit about maybe um, his wife. Um, and then he's going to come, and he's going to sing for us tonight. And uh, I like it because Jackie sings like a hillbilly. And I like hillbillies. Um, my mother grew up in Anderson, South Carolina, 
where the ducks go barefooted down there. And I appreciate Jackie Freeman and Vicki, his daughter. Uh, thank God for them. What a blessing they are. And uh, I'm going to ask Jackie, come on up here, Jackie, if you will. And uh, I want you to sing for us and uh, introduce this song, if you, if you will. Come on up. And then after that, we've got Double Barrel Blessings with the Ryder uh, family. And uh, Jackie, come on up here with me. I appreciate it. And uh, God bless your heart. And uh, you've been a blessing to our church. And uh, your, your daughter has been a blessing to our church as well. Thank you. We really appreciate you. And if you just take a moment to explain a little bit about uh, your wife, who is now with Jesus. And... Um, a little bit that went into this song that you're going to sing for us. I appreciate it so very, very much. My name is uh, Jack Freeman, sometimes re referred to as That Hillbilly. And uh, I grew up in West Virginia, and the nearest neighbor was half a mile away. And in that time, the Lord saw fit to bring a wonderful lady into my life. And we was together 67 years. <laughs> two days ago marked two days that since she had gone home to be with the Lord. And on the, the last birthday that her and I shared, I couldn't get out to buy her nothing, so I wrote her a song. And it goes something like this. I ask for y'all's patience. Once there was a little girl who lived down the hill from me. I liked that little girl when she was only three. I played with her brother so I could be near. That little girl didn't seem to notice or to care. Time moved along, more attention of her I took. Then I learned that teenage girl, hey, that teenage girl could cook. And <laughs> in, in her late teens, she finally noticed me. It made me happy. Ooh, I was happy as could be. So I asked the Lord, Lord, please let her marry me. And we did that in 1953. Hand in hand, we moved along to this very day. And we wouldn't have it now any other way. Now it's her birthday. I love her more than then. She stayed with me through troubles thick and thin. As we look on down the road at what might be ahead, together we can face it without a moment of dread. Now it's her birthday, and there's one thing I like to boast. She's my life's companion, and I still love her most. Amen. Thank you all.
Thank you, riders. That was wonderful. That was great. Uh, take your Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 32. Genesis chapter 32. And uh, just to clarify a couple of things, uh, today uh, we had sent a message out saying that we're going to have s'mores and hot dogs, and I'm sure everybody was really looking forward to that, but we just weren't sure about this rain, uh, if we're going to get it or not, and that could be a little bit of a damper uh, on our fire, no pun intended. So uh, we were like, all right, let's throw an audible, and uh, we're going to have some cookies and milk uh, after a service in the fellowship hall, and then next week we'll have our s'mores and hot dogs, and I believe we've got a water slide. Uh, is on the, the docket for the kids. And if adults, you want to do it, hey, more power to you. I'd love to see Jack go down that water slide yeah. next Sunday night. That'd be awesome. Uh, he'd be singing all the way down. So it'll be a good time. Uh, so after the service, we'll have our, cook and, our cookies and uh, milk afterwards. Uh, before I get into it, I just want to say thank you to many of you who texted or uh, posted on social media or whatever yesterday uh, for, for my birthday. I appreciate that. And uh, that was very kind of you taking the time out uh, to reach out to me. Uh, Genesis chapter 32. And uh, we're going to get right into our passage today. And uh, this won't be super long, but I hope that uh, you'll allow the Lord to speak to you as we get into His Word. So we're going to read just a few verses in our passage here. And we find ourselves coming to the life of a man that many of us are aware of and familiar with. We find ourselves coming to the life of Jacob. In Genesis chapter 32, I'm sure that some of you in this room, you have a favorite book of the Bible. Maybe you have a life verse or maybe a favorite chapter. Uh, for me, I have a favorite book. I love the book of Jonah. My life verse is Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 10. But my favorite chapter is Genesis chapter 32. And I love this passage and the importance of this passage. And really the, the testimony of my life woven in this passage and how I can see the Lord dealing in my heart in a similar way. So we're going to read a few, a few verses of our passage and pray and get into our message tonight. We're going to start reading Genesis chapter 32 in verse number 22. It says this, And he, Jacob, rose up that night and took his two wives and his two women servants and his eleven sons and passed over the ford Jabbok. And he took them and sent them over the brook and sent, the, sent over that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he had saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he, Jacob, said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. And he said unto him, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall, no, shall, call, shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. For I have seen God, face to face, and my life is preserved. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for loving us. Lord, we thank you for saving us. And Lord, we thank you just for being so good to us. And Lord, we thank you for the fact that we can worship here tonight, that we can open up your word, and that we can hear from it. And Father, I pray that as we look into the life of one of your servants, Jacob, Lord Israel, we pray that you'd help us to understand this text, that we'd understand this passage. Lord, we'd apply it to our lives. And Lord, I pray that you would speak to us and help us as you work in our hearts, Lord. We pray that we would not just be hearers, but as your word says, to be doers. We pray that decisions would be made that would honor and glorify you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Every day we're faced with decisions. Many of them are very minute and seemingly insignificant, but every decision confronts us with a choice to be made. Some are easier choices. What will I have for breakfast? What will I wear? Where will I go? But in the middle of all these choices, our lives are shaped and made. You know, every day you face choices, decisions, moments where you must make a choice. And while many are small and seemingly insignificant, every decision has an effect on our lives. Yet in everyone's life, there seems to be a moment or moments that we would look back and classify them and call them defining moments in our life. For me, I'll never forget one of those moments that's probably outside of my salvation, outside of my, my marriage and having children. This was probably the largest defining moment that at the time seemed so insignificant. I'll never forget, I was, in, I was in my sophomore year of high school. 
And I decided that after school, the typical habit of our high school was that all the, the, the teenagers and all the people in the high school would go into the gymnasium and we'd play ball. we do whatever somebody wanted to decide that day. And I forget, it was the first day of basketball tryouts. And if you've ever seen me play basketball, you'd understand I did not play nor really attempt to play basketball in my high school career. I was not gifted in that realm. I threw bricks up and I missed a whole lot more than I made it. So I decided, you know what, this isn't for me. But I loved soccer. Now soccer season had just ended and I still had the bug for soccer and I wanted to play soccer. So my buddy Pete Ostergren, he said, hey, do you want to go and kick a soccer ball around in the gym before basketball warms up? I said, sure. Now our coach, Coach Connolly at the time, he said, hey, look, no shoes on the gym floor. You got to wear socks or you have to have dedicated gym basketball shoes. Well, I didn't have those shoes. And so I was like, all right, I want to play soccer. So I slipped my shoes off. I ran onto the court and we started playing soccer ball, kicking the ball around. We're having a good time like normal. We've done this many times before. But a choice that I made that was seemingly insignificant that I've done all the times was a detrimental choice. And that was taking my shoes off that day. As I started to play soccer with my buddy, we got a little rough and started pushing around and having a good time playing soccer, as you know, high school kids do. And I got shoved, and I fell on the floor. I got back up, and I started walking, and I said, wow, that really hurt my foot. And I looked down at my foot, and it didn't seem that different. It didn't seem anything unusual, so I kept walking. And my buddy Pete walked up and says, Tyler, your sock is bleeding. I said, well, Pete, socks don't bleed, but I'll, okay. And I looked down, and I saw this little circle get bigger and bigger and bigger. And I realized something's not right here. I sat down and took off my sock, and I'll spare a lot of the details, but long story short, I had a compound fracture on my large toe on my right foot. That, if, for those of you who don't know what that means, kids, I could see my bone when I was not supposed to be able to see my bone sticking out. I went to the hospital, the doctors came in, and they started taking pictures, and I said, what is going on? They said, we've never seen a break like this. This is just very weird, and if I don't want to gross people out with all the details of where the break was and how it happened and everything, but it was very unusual of what had happened. Doctors had never seen it before. Well, I didn't think it was a huge deal. I broke my toe. That's not fun. I'm in a boot for, you know, three months and I can't play any sports and it's kind of, you know, a bummer. And that was Halloween. I remember very specifically, I didn't get any candy or anything. I sat at home and I just mellowed out and had a broken toe. January 25th, I found myself in St. Agnes Hospital with my blood sugar of 720. And I looked at the doctor and I was very sick, very sick. And I looked at the doctor and I said, how? I'm on the swim team, I play lacrosse, I play soccer, I'm active. How do I have type one diabetes all of a sudden? And they said, well, the only thing we can say is, was there a traumatic experience that had happened anytime recently? I said, well, yeah, Halloween, I broke my toe and had a compound fracture. Long story short, they looked at the blood work and they said, yeah, that probably did it. See, breaking my toe was a defining moment. I didn't think it was that big of a deal, but that was a moment that caused me to be a diabetic. An insignificant decision had a great impact on my life. Every day, we make choices. And as insignificant as they may, be, may seem to us, many times they shape and create these defining moments. All of us in this room probably, if we're older, has had a defining moment or will have defining moments. And as we look at the life of Jacob, I see a man that truly, this in my opinion, was one of Jacob's greatest defining moments that changed Jacob more than any other moment in Jacob's life. A moment that we would look back and realize our life is not the same since that decision. In these defining moments, how will you respond to God's will for your life. As we look at our passage, we find a story of a man's life when he comes to this moment. And, and I want to notice today, let's see how this man got to this place where he could have this truly defining moment that we too can experience today. First of all, as we look at the life of Jacob, we see in our passage here, number one, that Jacob had to come to a place of seclusion. He had to come to a place of seclusion. Look what it says in verse number 22. It says, And he rose up that night and took his two wives and his two women servants and his eleven sons and passed over the four Jabbok. And he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over that he had. See, as we meet Jacob, we find a man under the spotlight of God going through an incredible experience today. 
We find Jacob in most likely the largest and biggest trial that Jacob has faced. You see, God tells Jacob in just a few moments, your brother is going to meet you, Esau. Jacob and Esau didn't really have a good relationship as brothers. In fact, Jacob was very concerned because I believe the Bible says about 400 men were following with Esau and was coming to, to meet Jacob. So now Jacob believes Jake, Esau is coming to kill me. And now Jacob is stressed out and frantic and he sends all of his family, his wives and kids and everything they had. And he sends them over and distances himself because he believes in the morning Esau is coming to end his life. The meeting is coming in the morning. So now Jacob is, placed, is forced into a place of seclusion. Sends his family away. And the Bible says in verse number 24, and Jacob was left alone. See, as Jacob begins to wrestle, the Bible says he was left alone and wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. As he wrestles with this man, he realizes that this man is no normal man at all. See, Jacob finds himself in an actual wrestling match with God. And at the end of this wrestling match, and we know the story as we read that, Jacob's life is truly changed, forever changed after this meeting. This was a defining moment in Jacob's life. This is where his life was completely changed. But notice as we reread this passage, something interesting about this. Verse number 22, and he rose up that night and took his wives and he sent them away. Verse 23, and he took them and sent them over the brook and sent them over that he had. And Jacob was left alone and there wrestled a man with him unto the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh. And the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. See, in order for Jacob to come to this defining moment, he had to get into a place of seclusion. This meant for Jacob, he had to push everything aside and away to meet with God. Jacob sends everyone away and now is forced into a place of solitude. And what this meant for Jacob was Jacob had to leave all of his comforts. Jacob had to leave all of his distractions to be alone with God. He left family, home, wealth, and possessions, and power, and now comes to a place with no distractions, no noises, him and God. Someone once said that solitude is the audience chamber of God. My friend, it took Jacob distracting and dis, or dis, distancing himself from all distractions and finding himself in silence to meet with God. Mark it down, many times God meets with his most choice servants in solitude, in silence. You think about it. I think of the life of Elijah. Elijah was expecting God to, to meet with him in an amazing and special way. And so Elijah sees the earthquake and Elijah's like, all right, man, here comes God. God's going to speak, but God doesn't speak. Elijah looks at the whirlwind and everything that's going on, the fires and all the big flashy things and all these great and powerful things. And Elijah's like, all right, God, I'm ready for you to speak. But God didn't speak to him that way. No, if you know the passage, God spoke to him in a still, small voice. I wonder, do you know what it's like to get alone in silence with God? You may say, yes, I know. Do you? Do you get alone with God? See, we need to learn what it means to come to a place of seclusion. I think of Mary and Martha. And we know that one chose the greater thing. One was always busy moving around in all these distractions, but one sat at the feet of Jesus. Does that define you? We live in a day where we're always busy. We're always running around. We look at our schedule, and our schedule is just jam-packed with everything from the moment that we get up and we start moving and going and meet this person and go to this place and have these sports and have these games and have these hobbies and all these other things, and we get so distracted that we never just pull away. And get alone with God. Do you know what it's like to get away? To pull yourself from all distractions. To put this thing down. To pull this out. And spend time with your Savior. See, Jacob's life was always busy. Always full of scheming. Trying to do what he wanted to do. And try to get his way. But his defining moment came when he got into a place of seclusion with God. Do you know how to get there? Do you know what it's like to push everything and everyone else away just to meet with God? To be in no one else's presence? I'll never forget, as a young Bible college student, I didn't know this. 
And I expected as I went to, to college, man, we've got revival. And I was thinking, man, God's going to speak to us in revival. And this is going to be it. And I remember looking at missions conferences and all these great conferences and all these other things. And all of us seem to sometimes fall into this trap where we expect God to speak to us at this conference or at this retreat or at this camp or at this place where this big speaker is coming. But God wants to speak to us in solitude. I'll never forget experiences myself. The busyness of college and running around and work and juggling finances and fiancé and all these other things. And I found myself many times where God did the greatest work was in a cold, stinky, but quiet stairwell. Either early in the morning or late at night. Uncomfortable as all get out. But God spoke to me. You know, the a defining moment is only going to come when we get into a place of seclusion. Where we get alone and set everything aside and spend time with God. But not only did he come to a place of seclusion, notice, secondly, he had to come to a place of submission in his life. See, as Jacob begins to wrestle with God, we have to understand something, that this is not the first time that Jacob meets with God. You see, the first time that Jacob meets with God, we find in Bethel. And God reveals his plan for Jacob's life. And some people have argued and really defined this as Jacob at this moment becomes a believing man in his life. Where Jacob realizes that God has a plan and that he's going to follow this plan to the best of his ability. And God maps it out for Jacob and Jacob believes God. But Jacob has lived a life, all of his life scheming and trying to get what he wants, when he wants, how he wants it. Jacob's the deceiver, the trickster. But as Jacob lives his life doing what he wants to, now he comes to meet God the second time. And as Jacob meets with God at Jabbok, he moves from a believing man, now catch this, to a broken man. See, Jacob is about to die to self. Look what it says in verse number 24. And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. See, before we move on, we need to understand something here. That the Bible says in this passage that the Lord is the one that initiates the, this wrestling match with Jacob. And this makes sense because Jacob all of his life, like I said, had, had been rebelling and resisting and, and tricking and lying and, and trying to get things the way that he wanted to get them. And so this was a normal occurrence for Jacob. And so now God begins to wrestle with him. He's resisted God all of his life, so this just seems to be natural. But as God deals with Jacob, Jacob begins to resist and refuses to give in. I don't know about you, but if God Almighty is going to wrestle me, I'm tapping out immediately. And all of us would say, yeah, that, that, that's exactly right, but how often do we do that? We're believing. Yes, we know Christ is our Savior, but from the day-to-day -day lives, we struggle so much because we lie, we scheme, we try to fix things in our own, and we try to craft the solutions that we want, and we do things, and we, we never consult God about these things, and then when we get there, we say, God, bless us, please, and all this time we're living like Jacob, figuring it out on our own, doing what we want to do, how we want to do it, when we want to do it, where we want to do it, resisting God, believing, but resisting. Now God meets with him and begins to deal with Jacob and begins to bring him into a place of submission. God literally had to break Jacob. Pull his thigh out of joint. But this is amazing to me. See, Jacob wrestles with God and wouldn't surrender and eventually God had to break him in more than one way. We see in verse number 25, it says that he took and in the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. See, Jacob's humiliation was the beginning of the blessings in his life. See, as God wrestled with Jacob, the Bible says that God touched him and the hollow of his thigh was thrown out of joint. And now catch this. Jacob now is moving. If you read our passage, he now moves from wrestling to clinging to God. Jacob now could no longer, you may say, well, what do you mean by clinging? You see, Jacob could no longer stand in his own power. Jacob, in order for him to stay up, had to literally cling himself onto the Lord. And now from depending on himself, now Jacob is depending on God. 
See, when Jacob was broken, he went from complete dependency on himself and his own strength to complete dependency and reliance on God. When he lost his strength, he realizes that he could no longer stand on his own. See, this story, we read this story and we think about Jacob's triumph over God. That's not what this story is about. This story is about God's triumph over Jacob. When Jacob stopped depending on himself and doing his own things when he, and started clinging to the Lord, that's when the blessings came. So where are you tonight? Do you find yourself wrestling and resisting God's will? Or do you find yourself clinging to Him? Are you running, rebelling? Or are you doing your own things? Or are you submitting to the Lord? Someone once said that the Lord cannot fully bless a man until he has first conquered him. And some of us in this room maybe have living a life like Jacob. Always doing what we want to do. Scheming, lying, wrestling, resisting the will of God for our life. We do, and many of us fall guilty, myself included. We do what we want to do with the right motivations without ever consulting God about it. And we disguise what we think as a good thing, as a God thing, when all this time it's not what God wanted for us. Some of us in this room know exactly what I mean. Maybe some of you in this room, you felt God's calling on your life to serve Him, but you resist it. Maybe God's working in your heart to serve in a particular ministry, and you say, no, God, I'll, I'll do this instead. Scheme. Maybe for some of you in this room, there's something that God is doing in your life and and you clearly can sense God's leading and the Holy Spirit working in your life in this area, but you want to do what you want to do. Maybe some of us resist God's will. Maybe for some of the teenagers in this room, relationships. Involved in a relationship that you have no business being involved in. God's working, but you're resisting. We could go on and on. But maybe the Lord's convicting you about something, trying to break you. Can I encourage you? Stop wrestling and start submitting. You'll never have a defining moment until God conquers you. Some of us need to make a decision tonight to stop wrestling, stop resisting, and start relying on God's leading in our life and submit to Him. And not only will we come to a place of seclusion, did he come to a place of submission, but thirdly and finally, Jacob had to come to a place of admission. In his life. You say, what are you talking about? Admission in his life. See, as the story begins to conclude, we find the Lord asking Jacob a very interesting question in verse number 26. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. And he said unto him, This is God saying to Jacob, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. Now stop. First time I read this, I scratched my head. I said, now hold on a second. The Bible says in Psalm 147, verse number 5, Great is the Lord, and of great power His understanding is infinite. So if God knows everything, then why in the world is God asking him this question? He knows his name, so why is he asking this question? Someone once said God's never asked a question that he didn't know the answer to. And in Jacob's life, this is true. God knew exactly who Jacob was, but catch this. Jacob didn't know who Jacob was. Or at least Jacob maybe knew who he was, but now he was about to admit to who he was. So this wasn't a question that God asked, but rather a question for Jacob to realize. This was a statement of admission. What is your name? What's your name, Jacob? When Jacob answered, he understood why God asked. Many of us in this room, we know Jacob's name, what it means. Supplanter, deceiver, liar, trickster. Jacob, what is your name? I'm a deceiver. I'm a liar. I'm the guy who has always done things my way, lying, deceiving to get my way, wrestling, rebelling, resisting against you. And no doubt, this is what has come over Jacob's mind. And what's amazing is that the last time that Jacob was asked this question was by his father. Lying, deceiving, tricking. See, when Jacob got alone with God and came to the end of his self, he faced the question, who are you, Jacob, when it's just you and God? See, we need to learn to get alone with the Lord. We need to learn to, get, to let God get a hold of us 
and to show us who we truly are. For some of us, maybe we're the ones that have been living our life just like Jacob, doing what we want to do, always trying to get our way, wrestling and resisting. See, Jacob's life was changed after he meets with God and would never be the same. And we see this in verse 28. He said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel, for as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. See, when Jacob came to this defining moment in his life, Jacob didn't just receive a new name, but it's almost as if Jacob became a new nature. And he was a new person. Jacob was changed. See, Jacob didn't even walk the same. He didn't live the same. Jacob came to this defining moment and didn't live like he used to. He put that lifestyle behind him and became a changed man. But he would never have gotten there if he never fessed up and admitted who he truly was. Are you willing to be honest and transparent with God? You know what amazes me about that? Is that we try to deceive God and paint ourselves to be one picture, but the reality is God knows us better than we know ourselves. So who are we fooling? How foolish was it for Jacob to resist? Wrestling with God. Resisting, but yet we find ourselves doing this so often. We've seen it time and time again in our own lives. Guilty of resisting against God and then crafting something to be as if this was God-ordained or God had us to do this. But the reality is, we're like Jacob. You know, we see it many times where maybe a teenager or someone raises their hand and they know that God's speaking and they, they understand that God is leading them in a certain direction, but then they make no decision. Like I mentioned before, hearers but not doers. They've admitted that there's an issue, but they refuse to change. My friend, Jacob didn't live a life like the old man. Jacob recognized the issue. God broke him, and he clinged to him and relied on him for strength. Where are you tonight? Do you find yourself distracted? Do you find yourself in a situation much like Jacob? A situation of difficulty. Maybe you're in a trial. And then you're in that trial and you're just trying to figure it out. You're trying to find the way out and you want to do it your way. Can I admit, be transparent? That's me. The typical man. I've got to figure it out and I've got to do all these things and lay this plan out perfectly. And the reality is many times that God just laughs. Where are you? Do you find your place, do you find yourself in a place of seclusion where God can speak to you? For some of us in this room, we'll never see defining moments if we don't get there. So do you know what it's like to get alone with God? Do you submit to Him? Are you willing to be honest with Him and admit to who we truly are? If you're in that situation that you find like Jacob, a trial, a great difficulty, can I encourage you with this? Push aside everything and everyone and get alone with God. We look for everything else for solutions and the last resort seems to be God. Well, he should be the first. So do you get to a place of seclusion? Are you willing to be transparent and honest with God? And allow God to show you what needs to be changed and admit to what God is doing in your life to admit that there are areas where we need to obey in. Are you willing to act on it? A defining moment. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for loving us. We thank you for saving us. And Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for all the times in my life where you have and that you continue to speak to my life, speak to my heart, to show me the areas where I fail you, the areas in my life where I need to change. Lord, I pray that I would never get to a point like Jacob, resisting, scheming, trying to figure it out on my own. But Lord, to a place that's broken before you. Lord, help each and every one of us to prioritize our time with you. Or we get so busy, we get so distracted. And maybe there's some in this room that at one point in their life that that was a continual, habitual thing. That they'd spend time with you, but they've drifted. 
Lord, you want to do great things in our lives. And many times it comes when we're just alone with you. So Lord, help us to do that. Help us, I pray, that we would see defining moments as we meet with you alone. Lord, I love you. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Seclusion than in your favorite book in the Bible when Jonah found himself inside the belly of a great fish. Talking about seclusion. Wow. Uh, he got to learn something about God uh, that he couldn't learn any other place. Now, Jesus himself calls it a closet. And getting into the closet and spending time in seclusion with him. He himself needed seclusion, and to a solitary place is where he departed uh, a great while before the day, and that's where he prayed in seclusion. So a lot of great principles tonight, and we certainly need that quiet moment with the Lord. I don't know how many of our adults tonight have a quiet time with God. My quiet time is when I walk out the door every morning. And I look up into the sky and I see whether the stars are clouds and I thank God for both. And then I start talking with him and uh, we spend a little time together. I jump in my vehicle and we just uh, talk together a little bit. By the way, while I'm driving, I don't mind doing that. Uh, there's all different avenues of approach when it comes to God. When's the last time you found yourself in seclusion with the Lord by yourself, somewhere in your home, alone? Think about that for a moment. When's the last time you found yourself here at this altar, you and God alone? Forget about the person next to you. Not your husband, not your wife, not your kids. Just coming alone, you and God, and talking with him just for a moment. Very, very special lesson tonight on quiet moments with the Lord. And we need those moments. And thank you for the message tonight. Great challenge. Well understood. And uh, seclusion. Amen. Um, got you a little something here that you can have in seclusion all by yourself, to help your sugar problem. This is your little birthday cake. All right, and uh, you coffee with um, Duncan. Uh, just a little cake, uh, just to say we love you. Happy birthday to you. You didn't know it's his birthday? By all means, it's not too late to treat him, so feel free to do that. All your staff, uh, certainly we appreciate all of our staff, and uh, thank God for them and the very special moments that we have the opportunity just to say a little something to you. And um, I thought, well, you might not be able to eat that, but I'm sure your kids could carve into that pretty good. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> okay. Happy birthday, Pastor Tyler. I appreciate it. How old are you now? 31. 31 years old. Wow. Isn't that something? Wow. It's amazing, isn't it? I was 30 years old when we started this ministry, and you're 31. You wasn't even alive. That's right. You were in, you were in the mind of God. We appreciate that. You were secluded in the mind of God. Wow. Anyway, uh, happy birthday to you tonight. Uh, Jackie, thank you for singing tonight. Amen. That was a real blessing. And you and your daughter, I think, are going to work on a song together that you can sing for us. And that's a blessing. So thank you for doing that. Very, very grateful uh, for your presence tonight and uh, participation tonight in our service and music. We appreciate it. We have uh, the opportunity tonight, have a couple of gentlemen here this evening that are going to come and they're going to receive our tithes and offerings tonight. So come on up, gentlemen. I appreciate it very, very much. 
Thank you. You look great tonight. Uh, never stop sporting the tie. Amen? Love the tie. It really looks nice. All right? He always sports the tie. His name is Tyler. Amen? All right. I appreciate you guys. And uh, listen, your dad preached tonight. So I guess it's important that you come up here tonight and pray. Come on up. Right up here. And you can just here. I think you can reach it right there. And you lead us in prayer tonight and give thanks to the Lord. Amen. Dear Father, thank you for this day and that and that um that all fingers well in Jesus' name. Pray amen. Amen. Thank you, sir. Don't forget to pick up a copy of the Treasures from the Testaments today. Uh, this one's on the subject of summer and how summer is a treasure to you. So get that and read that. Very, very, very helpful. I think you'll gain some insights. It'll help you to think whether or not the Lord Jesus is coming back in the summer. I'll leave it at that and you can go and read the devotional and find out where I'm going with that. All right. Uh, I think I'm going to ask Pastor Corey, you're going to come up here tonight and wrap things up this evening and uh, please uh, give a big push if you will for our 9-11 uh, Sunday I'm excited about that 9-1-1 uh, great great service up and coming Chris I did reach out to Donovan so Lord willing he's going to help us I'm excited about that I didn't realize he might be the one bringing it down that'll be special tonight looking forward to that so uh Pastor Corey, come on up and uh, just give us some plugs for what's up and coming, if you will, please. Okay. I was just talking with Pastor Tyler to make sure he draws my number in a second so that I can win the prize, whatever it is, between 18 and 54, because officially at 55, you're in the young... Yeah, somebody, somebody else said it, not me. Somebody else said you're old. So Young at heart, though, right? That's the uh, new senior ministry. If you have questions about it... Uh, see Pastor Mike, he's kind of spearheading those activities along with Pastor, and they've got some things in the works, but the first one is the barbecue and bingo, and you can sign up on Church Center, and if you don't like Church Center, you can go see Pastor Mike, and we'll figure something out, I don't know, but uh, anyway, there's no, no uh, entry fee, I don't believe, for playing bingo, so anyway, no cash prizes either, <laughs> well, you just lost half your group, sorry about that. <laughs> Anyway, that is the first uh, Young at Heart activity coming up on September 17th, correct? And uh, that'll be fun, I'm sure. So I'm going to come to it. I know I don't fit the category, but uh, I want to see what I had to look forward to, all right? We're going to have a good time. This is our Focus on the Family Month. Uh, we're kind of coming to a close of August, and uh, we'll be getting ready to gear up for the, for the uh, fall quarter and everything that it uh, holds for us. We have our men's prayer breakfast next Sunday morning on the 28th at 6.30. And then I want to encourage you to be there. Please do us a favor, though, and sign up if you're planning on coming. That just really helps us out in planning for how much food to prepare. And by we, I mean uh, Leslie as she cooks because I don't do any of that, all right? So please help us out with that. That would be a big help. Uh, if you have children that are signing up for Master Clubs, please get that accomplished sooner than later. That way we can get everything lined up as far as classes go. If you have questions, I'll talk to Brother Greg or Pastor Tyler about that. And then also if you're interested in volunteering for Master Clubs. If you have questions about it, see either of those men. Uh, but if you're just ready to sign up, sign up on Church Center and we'll get you squared away there. And then Desire for Choir is on September 10th. If you're planning on being in the choir or are interested at all in singing, 
Uh, make sure you talk to Pastor Mike with any questions. And then there are some leftover 9-11 uh, invitations in the lobby. So make sure you grab some of those. They don't do any good here. Take them with you. Uh, look for someone. Hey, maybe you should go speeding so you can get pulled over and you can give one to someone. All right? That would be helpful, I'm sure. <laughs> Matt just looks at me and shakes his head. <laughs> You're an encourager, man. I appreciate you. All right, Pastor Tyler's going to come on up, and he's going to draw our tickets for uh, whoever the, the younger adult is that wins the prize. What is the prize tonight, by the way? Uh, it's a mystery. It's a mystery prize? Oh, it's down. Oh, I thought you meant the tickets were down here. I got gotcha. you. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm on the lapel. I, or I took the lapel off. So, all right, our prize is goodies. Oh, it's a prize. Diabetes in a bag right there. All right. 100th anniversary, and then, uh, oh, even better, a lot of uh, little candies, these things, drops, sand it drops, are great, and then uh, what you really came for tonight is a gift card to Cracker Barrel, so it's a nice little gift, nice little package, and so, all right, now I heard a rumor that uh, somebody hacked the system of our, uh, our whole, you know, raffle drawing or whatever it is so tonight somebody got in because they're 54 and the next week we have the 55 and plus and this individual is going to be 55 <laughs> dom spano <laughs> dom's into this drawing and then next week technically following the rules he'll be 55 so he's in next week so if he wins both of them something's up there's not something there's something up there I, i'm setting my tickets out here and uh I'll be honest, I won't look in here. So if I draw, I'm not doing it on purpose. What's up? Does everybody have tickets? I don't have the roll. The roll was called up yonder somewhere. Where'd it go? You have it? Oh, it's right here. All right. Who did not get it? Somebody give me a hand for each one. And what is the age on this one? Oh, no, no. Let me back up. Hold on. Let me back in. If you're 54 and younger, If you're 54 or younger, all right, here you go, Pastor Mike. Yeah, the whole room. Just three of you? Four? Right. Who else? Just four? Just right. four. Speak now. All right, four. All right, and then I'll put those in the. up. All right, just so you know, I'm not looking. Liam, do you want to come pull this for me? So it's a fair pull. Liam, come here, man. Liam will come and pull. Come here, man. He's going to pull it. You need another one? All right, Liam. Do you know your dad's number? I don't. Oh, good. All right, cool. All right. Here we go. Just pull it and then hand it to me once you get it. All right. All right. I can tell you I didn't win it. So there goes that. All right. The number is five, six, one, five, three, six, one. Three, six, one. No one? No one? No, three, six, one. Right there, Miss Martha, you got the ticket over there? Sister-in-law? All right, very good, all right. Slave. All right, well, uh, oh, she's going that way. All right, well, don't eat it all tonight. That would not go well. Go to Cracker Barrel, have cookies and milk and candy, and yeah, that would not be very good. All right, well, thank you again for coming tonight. Uh, we'll be dismissed in a word of prayer, and then uh, just make sure that uh, we have cookies and milk if you want to head into the fellowship hall after our service and uh, avail yourself to that and hang out and fellowship 
at fellowship a little bit. All right, let's pray, and then we'll be dismissed. Father, again, we thank you for loving us and saving us. Thank you for giving us a good night in your house, Lord. Bless the fellowship to follow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.